Hello, welcome to Canada Files. I'm Jim Deeks. You know, since the beginning of the rock and roll era in popular music, roughly 65 years ago, Canadian performers and producers have played a profoundly significant role in its development. From Paul Anka to Gordon Lightfoot to Neil Young and Joni Mitchell to Shania Twain, Drake, and Justin Bieber today. And among the list of rock bands, very few stand as tall as the band, who blended several different musical influences into what's become known as Americana rock from 1968 to 1976. Our guest on this episode is Robbie Robertson, the Canadian leader of the band, who's gone on to a phenomenally successful career as a solo performer, producer, soundtrack composer, occasional actor, and author. Robbie, I suspect that not many of our viewers would know that the blood that runs in your veins is one half Indian, your mother was Mohawk specifically, and one half Jewish, and that you were born and raised in Toronto and spent a lot of your youth on the Six Nations Indian Reserve about 70 miles southwest of Toronto. But you've lived more than half your life now in the United States. So how do you define yourself today, Robbie Robertson? Are you American? Are you Canadian? Are you Native American? All of the above? You know, it's interesting. In the North American Indian world, uh, there are no borders. And, uh, and I remember hearing a story of an elder years ago, I think out in Western Canada, and he was going to visit his relatives, and they lived across the border. And they said, well, you have to stop here. They have to check you for going across. He said, check me for going to see my, who put this line here? There's no line here. And so anyway, maybe I'm part of that, uh, part, that part of the culture. Is there one label, though, that you feel closer to, i.e. American, Canadian, or, or indigenous? Oh, I think now? that I'm a Canadian. Yes. So how, if at all, does being Canadian or has being Canadian influenced your music, either from your early years or your years with the band or in your solo career? I mean, there's not really a Canadian sound, but you are Canadian. Well, I don't know. I think that I'm part of inventing the Canadian sound. Um, I don't know, you, you could think as Joni Mitchell might be part of the Canadian sound, and Neil Young, and Leonard Cohen. You know what I mean? It's, it's something. Because when I was 16 years old, I went from Canada down to the Mississippi Delta. And at the time, in the beginning of rock and roll and everything, that was like the holy land of music down there. That's where it seemed like everybody came from. And I was extremely curious about how can this area, how can this part of the world, how can it give birth to so much music, so much great stuff, and, and, and be something that I wanna be a part of. I wanna, I wanna bring my Canadianism into that world. So when I got down there, I was excited and, and full of ambition, but I soon realized that I was too inexperienced, too young, not a good enough guitar player yet, and I was from Canada. There's no Canadians in southern rock and roll bands. That's illegal. I had to rise to an occasion here. And growing up in Canada, <clears throat> we have a bit of a like, we're from too far away. We're not from the center of where everything is happening. So it means we have to work harder, try harder, and bring some talent to the table. It was very courageous, as you mentioned. You were 16 years old, and you took a train 
by yourself all the way down there. I mean, looking back, you actually quit school and uh, left home at that age. Are you amazed that you had the guts to do that then and also that your mother let you go? That was a bit of a tough sell <clears throat> to my mother. and But that thing of if I don't find out, if I don't try, if I don't show up, I'll be sorry the rest of my life. Had you already decided at that point that you wanted to make music your life's work, or did you just think it was cool to play a guitar? I was on a mission. I, this was a direct, a direct mission too. I wanted to be part of that world. I wanted to conquer that thing that they would let me in the door. And, uh, and I, I, be, I had such a fever for this music. I didn't know how to be denied. You got the job with Ronnie Hawkins and you were with the Hawks for about four years and then a brief hiatus, and then you actually became, you and four of your colleagues, three of your colleagues from the Hawks, became the backup band for Bob Dylan, who was going through the painful transition of going from being a folk singer to a folk rock artist. And with Bob Dylan, it was like being part of a revolution. This was changing the rules. This was a discovery process in what you could do in music that had never been done before. And that you would do this against the odds, that people weren't accepting this. And most, most people would say, oh, the audience doesn't like it. We should make some changes then. We should try this and try that and see if that makes them happy. No, no, that's not the way it worked. It was like, <clears throat> no, let's just play faster and louder in their face. And as it turned out, um, what we were doing, uh, it won in the end. Time... Turned, it turned out to be that this music was revolutionary. It turned out that the world did come around. We didn't come around, the world came around. And so that was kind of a spunky feeling of achievement. Well, you, you really almost spent two years on stages getting booed with Dylan. I mean, that must have been very debilitating. But you then went on, after the Dylan years, you went on to form the band, and that's an interesting story in itself. But the band has obviously been such a major part of your life, although, in retrospect, it was only 15 years of your life, from about 61 to 76. Is the band legacy somewhat of a shackle to you? Do you get tired of talking about the band, considering that it was such a small part of your life now? I don't think of it as a small part of my life at all. Chronologically, I mean. Yeah. I think that we achieved something that we were so lucky to, to be in certain places at certain times and invent something and a music that had a tremendous effect on the culture, on music at the time. And once again, we didn't bend. Something came out of this, and, I, and I've just revisited this because I just put together the 50th anniversary collection of the band album. The Brown album, as the it's Brown called. The Brown album. And in revisiting that and working on this thing and going back to that period um, there was nothing to compare it to. Um, the music on that record had nothing to do with what was popular, what was in vogue, or what people were expecting, anything like that. And it wasn't, and never ever, 
with the other guys in the band did we ever say, let's do something to be different. Never, ever. This was from the ground up. This was our soul, our musical soul in that. And it had to do with being together for many years before we made our first album, Music from Big Pink. We had been out there woodshedding, learning our craft, gathering musicalities, incorporating them into our gumbo of music. And Gumbo's then, the right word. <laughs> yeah, because it was a mixture of many things. And so <clears throat> when, when we were able to do what we were able to do, it... It, it had such a timeless quality to it that it seemed like it had been around and been around. And it was, it, 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 it was a story of a musical journey in itself. And so it never, ever felt brief to me because I started playing with Levon when I was 16 years old, and when we did the last waltz, it was 16 years later. So that was a pretty good run. But then, in my musical journey, I had so much more that I had to discover and I was curious about and the challenges that I wanted and you know all of the, the things on my list of stuff that I knew that I had to do was this long, so. Looking back though, on those years, and the breakup happened in 76, and it ultimately developed into some personal animosity, which we don't need to get into, but I wonder if you look back and regret the breakup, not because of the personal animosity, but because of the continuation of creative genius that you guys could perhaps have rekindled if you'd stayed together, or do you think it had run its course and it was better to let it go then? The journey with the band, this musical arc, this experience that we had together, the stories, everything that went into that seemed like a very complete journey. And then... What told us that we had done what we needed to do was the way we all reacted after that. My expectations were that we were all going to have a little breather. Some of the guys wanted to make solo records or do other projects, which I thought was very good and very healthy. Then we would regroup with a freshness and an excitement and do some fantastic work. But because nobody came back, everybody forgot to come back, <laughs> it, it, it just told you, okay, I, I accept that and I get that. I had an incredible relationship with Levon for most of our lives, just incredible. And what a special person and a special talent he was. Loved Rick, loved Richard, loved Garth. It, there was no animosity. It's just that nobody reconvened. If you ever put together a top 10 list, Robbie Robertson's top 10 list of the greatest bands of all time, where would the band rank? Oh, it's not my job to to talk about the band in in that context. Um, But I think it was pretty significant, the mark that this group left on music. Well, I would agree with that. Let's talk about your solo career, which actually didn't begin for almost a decade after the breakup of the band. What took so long for you to get back into the recording studio? Um, I didn't have any um, real desire to get back into the studio. <clears throat> First of all, I made a movie about the last, the last waltz, about I'm walking away from the road. I had done it, I started when I was so young, and I wasn't, 
it, 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 it turned into just a business to me. And it's a wonderful thing to go out and perform and people uh, really appreciate it and people pay you and cheer you and all that kind of stuff. But I thought, I've done that. I've seen that. I did it with these guys. I did it with Bob Dylan. I did it with Veronica. I've seen it every which way you can look at it. We played the grimiest joints in the world and we played the biggest concert in the world. We had done the, the, the whole thing. So I didn't feel like, I, you know, other, other than earning a living, that that was what I was drawn to. And I was trying to, I was trying to find the path that would really pull me somewhere and I would learn something from it. And that turned out, so after, after the last waltz, then I went and I did this movie, Carney, yes. and produced this and was part of it. It was an incredible experience, learning experience too. And then Martin Scorsese asked me to work on the music for Raging Bull. And then he asked me to work on the music for King of Comedy. And there was- Let me interject. Martin had done The Last Waltz for you and the band. Yes. So that was your first collaboration together. So it started a very good friendship. Carry on. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it was all about, shall I go down this road? Hmm, this looks interesting. Maybe this could be fun. So it was all about, you know, just shuffling the deck. And then at a certain point, I thought, wow, I've got some ideas and some things that I'd really like to write about. I'll make a record now. Let me ask about your latest album, because you've just released uh, a few months ago. I think it's your sixth uh, solo album called Cinematic. Tell us a little bit about that, because in fact, it's been eight years since your last solo album. Again, you've been up to many, many things in between, but you got back into the recording studio again. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm off the treadmill of making records and going on tour. I don't do that. I make records when I have something to make a record about. <clears throat> and, and I don't feel a pressure to make a record. I don't, I don't think of what I do even as a career. <clears throat> I think what I do, and I don't even know what line of work I'm in really now because I don't see anybody else, you know, that is involved in the things that I'm involved in. So I do it as I like. And I think after all this time that maybe I've earned the right to do whatever the hell I want. So maybe I'm taking advantage of that. I hope so. Um, but anyway, I, I made this record because I had songs stirring around and I didn't know how to turn them off. So I had to just you know, go with that. And then I was working on The Irishman. Scorsese's latest film. Right. I'm working on the score for The Irishman and music in The Irishman, that a thing that Marty and I do. <clears throat> and they were making the documentary, Once We're Brothers, inspired by my book. So these things are going on, and I'm also putting together the band's 50th uh, uh, collector's edition thing. All these things are going on, and they're all entering into my writing process. And I loved it. I loved the idea of everything just opening up their arms to all of the projects. And so cinematic became connected to all of these things and inspired these things. I wrote a song called Once We're Brothers. Yes. And when the filmmakers that were doing the documentary on me, when the filmmakers heard that, they're like, oh my God, that's the heart of what we're talking about in this film. And we would like to call the film Once We're Brothers. 
that was great. And then there was music that I was doing on my album that Martin Scorsese said, this could work great in the movie. And then there were songs that were inspired by the movie that I was writing. So this whole... So it's all very seminal. All of this circular thing felt so good, and it makes you do what you want to do. You know, anyone who listens to your previous solo albums would realize what great music it is. But I think you'd probably agree that that the reaction hasn't been as wildly popular as the band's albums were back in 69, 70. Do you think your solo music has been underrated and, and overlooked, or does it matter to you? No, I don't think so at all. I've, you know, I've had such a tremendous time and working with the people that I've worked with, making these records too. On my first solo album, you too backs me up on a couple of songs on it. I do a couple of things with Peter Gabriel, a dear friend, and somebody that I love his music. And I work with Daniel Lanois, fellow Canadian. Um, <clears throat> and the record did really well, and I had nothing to complain about. And then I did a record, and I was celebrating New Orleans and the music of New Orleans, the people. So I'm just having such a fantastic ride. And if somebody likes it as well, and then I get to go back and do music that's part of a documentary that is another celebration of part of my heritage. How lucky am I? And then I make another record about First Nations peoples and they do a documentary on me making the record on the, the on that. And then the next record I make, I do it with my buddy Eric Clapton, who plays on just about every track on it and everything. So there isn't really a downside in in any of this. And the music business is different than it used to be. And it is what it is. So I don't know. I just I judge all of these things by my my own sense of satisfaction and accomplishment feeling, you know. Tell me what has given you the most pleasure in your career. Uh playing the guitar, writing songs, singing, although that really came later. You didn't sing much with the band, but between the playing, the writing of songs, the composing of music, putting together soundtracks, writing books, where do you get your most pleasure? I'm not really sure because I've never judged it like that, but <clears throat> when I write a piece of music, when I write a song and I don't know have, and I, I have no idea where this came from. Where did I get that? What is going on? This is kind of magical. And when I write something, the satisfaction and that feeling of pulling a rabbit out of the hat, that magical thing that is so mysterious, I do get a charge from that. So you're 76 years old now. I'm sorry to remind you of that fact, but... I, didn't, I don't mind at all. It's not old anymore. Um, <laughs> but it's a time when, perhaps in a previous generation, to paraphrase General MacArthur, you know, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. Is that what you're looking forward to? I suspect not. You're just so busy now. But do you ever just want to fade away? Um, I don't even know what that means fade away. Um, I'm going to go out kicking and screaming. Um, I just got so much that I need to do, so much that I want to do. Um, and I mean, even in my new record, I just for the first time, I've revealed this artwork that I do. I've never revealed that before. And and the feeling I get from sharing that now and wanting to do so much more in that and so much more, and I'm already working on the new movie 
with Martin Scorsese. We're working on what might be the most extraordinary thing we've ever done. I am writing volume two of my memoir. This just takes me up to when I'm 32. The publisher said to me, you can't write your story and, and stop when you're 32. What's next? So I'm writing volume two of that. There's so much going on, so many places to go and so many people to see. What a great way to finish. Thank you so much for this. This has thank been you, delightful. Cheers. Pleasure. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time with more Canada Files. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Richard and Donna Ivey, as well as the following donors. The John and Jocelyn Barford Family Foundation, Mary Alice Davis, in memory of Glenn W. Davis, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, Alice and Ted Kernahan, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, Andrew and Valerie Pringle, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the Sonner Foundation, the Browning Watt Foundation, William E. Wilder, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.